Cena. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم دستور هذا دستور We are asking permission from our Sheikh inshallah to speak I ask him to send us knowledge that is going to be beneficial to us knowledge that is going to be beneficial a lot of things now is passing off as knowledge it is knowledge but is it beneficial for you? Who decides what is beneficial for you? When is going to be beneficial? This is important. Otherwise, everyone can say anything is truth and anything is knowledge. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the creator of knowledge, one of his names, Ya'lim, he had sent everything first to the Holy Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. They created everything for that most beloved one. And saying, give this, pass this to the people, to the insan, to those ones that are going to be first their authorities, their heads, not the physical ones only, but especially the spiritual ones, the prophets, and their inheritors. So real knowledge passes down through them. So many people are saying, what does God want from me? Very simple. He has said that over and over again to 124,000 prophets. The message never changed. Certain conditions will change, as conditions always change, but that foundation is still the same. And those prophets, they had inheritors thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, definitely, that will continue to give the same message so that no one is in a mystery, no one is confused to say, what is Allah saying? What does He want? You know, especially, you see, not so much in Hollywood movies, but Bollywood movies, they always have a sequence where they talk to God, <laughs> Allah, whatever word they want to use. I don't know what word they use in India to call that. And they're saying, and then something happens, and then they woke up. Allah is zahir and is batin. Allah is apparent, is manifest, and he's also hidden. So whichever way that you want to turn, whichever way you want to look, there is Allah. The message is there. Uh, so, but people, they will be fooled. If they are not holding on strongly to the prophets, they are going to be fooled first by their ego and then by shaitan. The ego is going to pull them to one way, and shaitan is going to continue to pull them to that way to go off the cliff. So when the truth is given, if you are not preserving it, they are called hakami, fighters, defenders of the truth, as all prophets and all saints are. If you're not taking care of it, protecting it, it is going to be corrupted, it is going to be destroyed, and they will destroy. Mm, so knowledge that is beneficial for you, we must know what it is. If you think you enter into tariqat to learn fiqh knowledge, to learn the fiqh, to learn laws of Islam, the do's and don'ts. I'm putting it very simply. Then that is only one small side of what tariqah is. Because we are aiming now to look into the more heavy, more important spiritual part. The why. Why are you doing it? And What is stopping you from doing it? The law just tells you, 
turn right and turn left. You turn right, you'll get this. You turn left, you get this. You pass the green, you're going to get a ticket. But the law does not concern with why you need to obey so much and why you disobey, especially why you disobey. It's not interested. It's not interested whether you disobey. What are the reasons? But if you disobey, you're going to get a ticket. In this way, we are trying to understand what makes us to become disobedient. This is very important knowledge. This is a spir spiritual knowledge. Because if you don't understand why you're disobeying, you're going to do it over and over again. Because you don't believe that it is wrong. You don't know why it is wrong. You just know, if I do it, I'm going to get a ticket. Which means, if I do it, I don't get a ticket, that means I should do it. That means it's really not wrong. That means I can get away with it. That means I should do it over and over again. Although it destroys you and others. India, as Shaykh Maulana and Shaykh Afandi had said, it is a land of prophets. Too. It is a land where so many of our grand sheikhs, physically they are buried there. Although in these days we can see that Shaykh Afandi had said, so many saints now, they are no longer here physically in this world also. Their, their power is not here. Their secrets are not here. Maybe their barakat is here and there at certain times, but they've all moved to behind the mountain of Kaf, waiting for Sahibu Zaman to give the call. When they do that, you see so many wrong things happening to that country. So many uh, curses that mankind, they're giving to each other. The punishment is coming down, but there is no protection from the saints because they are not there. They pulled it away. Why they pulled away? Why they pulled away that rahmat? So that the Lord not to each other and the curse from Allah is coming, raining down to the people. As Shem Allah had said, in the Ahir Zaman, you're going to see whole of mankind being pulled by shaitan in this 18-wheeler, strong, pulling them towards the edge of the cliff. And the awliya Allah are holding it strongly. On the other hand, on the other side, not to make them to fall. But because majority, they're insisting on following shaitan. So now, the awliya Allah, they have to let go. If they don't, they will be pulled down to the edge of the cliff. India is a land of saints and it's a land of prophets. But so many things there, everywhere else in the world too. Fire is burning. Belief is burning. Fire is burning. Confusion, it is everywhere. And the believers, they are suffering. Once, when Islam was ruling there, not when Islam is not ruling, Islam is ruling there, Islam had ruled there, Let's say for a thousand years. Eh? People are talking about the tragedy of Andalusia. Yes, Islam is there for 800 years. People hardly talk about the tragedy of Bukhara and Samarkand, of uh, Khorasan, of that part of the world. What is called? Huh? Huh? Delhi. Delhi. What do you call that part of the world? Hmm? Central Asia. Hmm? One, let's say, Iran, that part of the world. What we say? Huh? Hmm. Anyway, that part of the world. They're not talking about the tragedy of that part of the world. Why well, was carrying the flags, not just following, but carrying the flags of Ahlus Sunnat, uh, Iktikat, and Irshad and Tarikat. 800 years, that part of the world is Ahli Sunnat. Hmm. Then it became Shia through the blade of the sword. They're not speaking so much about that. The only people who sit up fiercely against them to actually declare war on them are the Ottomans to stop their fitna and fasad from reaching. But they don't like the Ottomans, so they don't say anything that the Ottomans has achieved. Nothing. All history books are empty from that. All they talk about the Ottomans 
are the apparent weaknesses and failures that betrayers from the inside and the enemies from outside collectively, they are raining down on the Ottomans for hundreds of years, never stopping. Never mind, we put that aside. But the tragedy of India now, after 1,000 years, Islam no longer ruled. And when Islam was ruling, it was high. And Ahli Sunnah was strong. Tariqat was very strong. But when there is no proper shariat coming from the sultans through the ulamas, even whatever that is there, it's going to get corrupt. So there was a time in the name of spirituality, in the name of harmony and love and interfaith, there was so much confusion because the beliefs were getting mixed up. Hmm. It was getting so mixed up. Top to bottom. And it took the Mujahid al-Sani, the second reformer in Islam, Imam Rabbani, our Grand Sheikh. Now, the power then that was given to him, when all the conditions were there, especially with Sultanate, he was able to stop all of that corruption that is happening. In the name of Tariqat, in the name of faith, he cancelled everything. He says, from now on, no more singing, no more dancing, no more whirling, no more uh, meulits, let's say. I'm using simple words to describe the harshness of his fatwas throughout the whole land. Because you did that so much, so long, and it's not giving you proper benefit. That knowledge is not giving you benefit. It's making you to become more in gaflet, more corruption to enter. As I said, the beliefs were getting mixed up. Hmm? I'll give you one example. The beliefs were getting mixed up, although it may not belong to the same era. But to show you the, when the conditions are right, corruption can grow very quickly. When some of the states in the south, in the Deccan, and they were heavily influenced by Shiism. And because it became very mystical, soon you have even the sultans that time writing poetry praising Hindu beliefs and Hindu, uh, let's say, ilahs, idols. They say, no, 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 it's representing this, representing that. They were doing it and it was allowed. Do you understand what it means for an Islamic ruler now to write poems to praise the Hindu goddesses? This is not part of our belief, obviously. So it can, not only in India, of course, in other parts of the world, but we are using this example. The question is coming from there. It can become that very easily. This is not to be confused by saying, now you need Wahhabism. It's not to be confused with that. In fact, so many people now, they are still upset with Imam Rabbani for doing all of that. They said he is the original Wahhabi in India. Whereas he is a Grand Sheikh of the Naqshbandi order. And what he is in implementing law and order according to Sharia is different. What he is uh, teaching to his, belie to his followers and his own uh, strong spiritual beliefs it is not for the public also. They're going to accuse him of so many things. Accuse him of different akida, maybe. And this is one thing we also must address a little bit here and there. They will accuse him. And they had accused him of that. So, but he came and he says, stop all this. No more of these excessive things. You're only going to call a zan. <laughs> You're only going to give some salawats. You're going to pray five times. Let's go down to the basics, clean everything up. Because in the name of love, of course people will do crazy things. But love is not without its shariat. Love has more shariat. Love has more laws. People who think, they come into tariqat to escape from shariat, they are a thousand times more wrong. 
because there are a thousand times more laws in tariqat than it is in sharia. It changes. It changes with the situation. It changes with the people. The protocol, the manners change, and it's flexible. One wrong thing you do, everything may burn, whereas in sharia you're protected. So, certain things creep up also in tariqat, of course. Back then, after that, and now, there are certain practices that are not so good. Like I said, we can say these things are not so encouraged, these things are not so good, without putting people to hell. You can say that. It's easy. If you have love for people, if you have hope for people, if you're carrying the traditions of the prophets, you are not easily going to just throw them to hell because your job is to make them to understand, to wake up, to clean them up. So you can say, this is not so encouraged, this is not so good. And you can do that, or if the power is not given to you, you just don't interfere. This is wrong, but at least this is something better. At least this is better than them going to nightclubs. This is better than them being secular. It is better. At least they're going to derga. Although they're doing certain things, it's not so good. So you learn how to draw the line and not to judge others. Oh, there is shirk, there is bid'ah, there is kufr, there is different akira or wrong akira. You're going to stop from that. You're going to turn and you're going to say, this is none of my business. This is none of my business to have this kind of good attitude to regular people. What about it is to the sheikhs or to those ones who are holding some authority that's given to them? More, you must step back. This is for people who are judging. For people who are asking for answers, it's different. For people who are really want to try to understand, it's different. For people who are caught in a situation where they have to put their feet into two worlds and try to understand, this is different. Now we're speaking just to the awam. So, they may have different uh, practices. What do our murids do? I'm going to tell you what our shay has been doing, what I observe him doing, and what I think it is good to do. That much I can say. I'm not going to quote from any book or any scholar. He is enough for me because he's representing now the 40 grand sheikhs. He is enough for me. He is more strong a dalil than any book or any scholar that we have out there. So, it is good for example, to show respect. First, you have to dress modestly. You have to pray two rakats if you can at home first. Because sometimes these dergas and these uh, makams, you cannot pray inside, it's too full. Uh, you pray at home, it's good. You are going to prepare once you leave your house until you reach there that you are not going to be distracted. You're not going to be on your phone looking at stupid things, and then suddenly you go to the derga or at the uh, tomb. You're not going to do that. You're going to busy yourself with salawats and with fatiha or other recitations, simple, to send to that person that you're going to see later. Then, to know that they are watching you, a thousand eyes are watching you, your behavior and your actions and your heart when you are there. And in your heart, meaning also, even if wrong things that you see, don't judge as it is in the Kaaba. Hmm? You'll be busy with yourself. And when you enter, it is good. If you cannot kiss the threshold, at least bend down to show your respect. Uh, and then to enter, give salams. First, from your shaykh. And then for everyone else that wants to give salam, and last yourself. Recite one Fatiha, 11 in class, recite some Yasin al-Sharif. Then give some Sadaqah if you like. Then 
if you can pray, if you cannot make some dua there to recite the Yasin, that's enough. If you can, to show some love and respect to the tomb, it is permissible now to go and to kiss some part of the tomb. Of course, here I'm talking about the men. If there are men and women mixed up, the women, you should know what to do. You should step back. If there's a lot of women, men should step back. This I have to say because there's some dergas, everything is mixed up, no? So try to have also that shariat when you are there. Watch your heart, display good manners, and then to walk. When you walk back, walk backwards. When you enter, of course, you enter with your right foot. When you leave, of course, you leave with your right, left foot first. Hmm? And it's simple. Don't sit there to bother them so much. Don't sit there asking for secrets or asking for too much of this dunya or ask them for revenge or ask them for uh, you know, so many of these things that people are going there to ask for miracles. Ask for forgiveness. Ask that you become better. Ask that you will be protected, your faith will be protected, you, your children, and also those ones who have passed before you. And then, if you like, this is good to do. Do some sort of service there, even if it's wiping some corner of the makam, cleaning some corner of the makam a little bit. Do that. And if there are people around there, especially if you see poor people, that's asking you, uh, give a little bit. If there are people that are irritating you or bothering you, try to walk away. Don't fight. Don't fight, but don't Open your heart and your arms and hug them either. Understand? Just walk away. Know what is right and wrong and walk away. Inshallah, that time you'll get the, uh, the benefit of that. All the other things that you want to do extra. Yes, sometimes it's according to the custom of the place. You're mentioning tying things. We don't recommend that. Um, don't, we, it's not necessary to go deep inside to open up 10 books and tell you the ruling of this and that. Not necessary. We're tariqat. Not necessary to do that so much. If you see other people do that, turn your face. You're not in the power or authority to tell them anything. You're not, they are not your responsibility. You not really important for you to do that. I'm saying this because it's not the practice of our sheikhs. Other people do it. Maybe some saint somewhere is allowing them to do it. I don't want to get involved. You understand? So, if there are other things, for example, sacrificing animal, well, we sacrifice an animal when we're at Yusha Ali Salam's tomb. There is a slaughterhouse some uh, way away from where the tomb is. We say, for the sake of Hazrat Yusha, we're sacrificing the meat we're given to the poor. That kind of uh, sacrifice is okay. Of course, we're not saying take the animal on top of the tomb and you cut the animal. I have to say this because people might also think it is like that. It is not like that. You understand? And the purpose now, other than sacrificing that for your own spiritual benefit, is to share the meat to the poor people. This is important to do also. So, otherwise, in the name of love, like I said, you do crazy things. And if it is not given permission, even those crazy things that you're doing may lead you to very wrong places. Those people in the beginning uh, who were supporting uh, those ones who were against the Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar, Hazrat Osman, they were using the word of the love of Hazrat Ali to that time and until now. They were using that word of love of Hazrat Ali to make them to hate is not good. Prophet ﷺ had never done that. There is no this, uh, how you say, uh, emotional blackmail that we use in Islam. No. So we have to be careful with these things. Inshallah Rahman, if we are doing that that way, 
our faith can be uh, protected. If it's not protected, a simple thing, a confusion that happens here and there, it will shake our faith and we're going to be in trouble. Wa min Allahu tawfiq al fatiha. Amen. Assalamu alaikum.